the Bronze Age, the rise and fall of the Hittites, the domination of the Greeks, then the Romans, the Byzantines, and finally the Ottoman Turks. Stories here are layered like an archaeological dig. How have they formed this fully lived-in landscape? I've been in Turkey before, but what I think I remember about Turkey and what I'm discovering about Turkey are vastly different. For 4,000 years, these dramatic volcanic formations have housed hand-dug tunnels and chambers. Underground networks store food, shelter animals. They've been churches, monasteries, and natural fortresses. In the 15th and 16th centuries, the Byzantine army used the tallest of these formations, like the Yushasar Castle, as an early warning system. With fire and mirrors, messages were sent from high top to high top, as far as Istanbul. Well, we're climbing the hill. We're going to look at the ferry chimneys when we get to the other side. I understand there's a really nice development of them there. Early Christians found refuge in this area of Goreb. The tunnels to the underground structures could be completely sealed off by huge stones. Very unusual. It's uh, uh, unique in all the world. I've never seen anything quite like it. I have seen volcanic land before, but very different from this. The rocks themselves are impressive, but the interaction of humans and how those spaces were used for worship and study and gathering and, and building community, it's... Uh, it's a fascinating story altogether. In the foreground, in the valley beneath us, there is already several fairy chimney formations came into being. Those single standing formations are called as... We are going to explore some cave churches here. We are going to learn about the early Christianity. Inside the church of St. Barbara, the early Christian monks drew a depiction of Christ on the throne as well as lines on the rocks to give the impression that cut stones were used in the construction. Cappadocia is, I mean, there's nothing like that anywhere in the world I've been, and it's just, uh, it's just a stunning place. Craftsmen in this region of Turkey have been manufacturing fired earthenware for almost 10,000 years. I always admire craftsmen who can work with their hands. And that it's a traditional that has, what, five generations, I believe, in the city. He has done this before. We are now going to the weekly marketplace of one of the central Anatolian towns and we are going to see what kind of business activities the local people are doing in that marketplace. Colors are just incredible, aren't they? It's good dog. She wants to give you the dog as a gift. Ask her why she doesn't like that dog. <laughs> the women have been very open about coming up to us and uh, having their picture taken, what, how wonderful they've been and what a good impression they've left. <laughs> the headscarves worn by these Muslim women are called hijabs. 
The term refers to the veil which separates man or the world from God. I love the bazaar. I think it's a wonderful way to see the common people and we've certainly seen what they buy and how many choices they have in the market. I'm amazed that there are so many fruits. Besides the ancient cultural heritage of the country, we see local people. We're going to go see how they make their bread in this village. This traditional flatbread is called markuk. It is baked for two to three minutes on a domed or convex metal griddle, known as a saj. Most Turkish families eat fresh bread with every meal. Thank you. This bread is wonderful with the cheese and parsley. Prior to 1997, children in Turkey were obliged to undertake five years of education. Thereafter, eight years. And in 2012, new legislation extended compulsory education to 12 years. My name is Charles, and it's spelled like this. And your name is? Yes. I had a lot of difficulty getting the name, the pronunciation of the name, but when I had the student write it, then I was able to pronounce his name correctly. And it was, it was very interesting. It was a good learning experience for me, too. <laughs> Since we believe so strongly in education, I'm very pleased to see how, how well the students interact and work with their teachers. Mark Antony of the Roman Empire is said to have picked the Turkish Riviera, also known as the Turquoise Coast, as the most beautiful wedding gift for his beloved Cleopatra of Egypt. The land surrounding these Mediterranean waters is home to abundant natural and archeological points of interest. Many are only accessible by water vessels called goulets. Among the archeological treasures are two of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the ruins of Masalos and the temple of Artemis that kind of uh, historical uh, building within these uh, mountains. I never knew that something like that even existed. Thirty-five years ago, I had a sailing instructor who had sailed his small boat all over the world. And he told us that the most beautiful place in the world to sail was the coast of Turkey. And this is it. Turkey's landscape has been shaped by a rich human history dating back to the end of the last ice age. But it is the people who live here today that make the most lasting impression. I think the people are really generous and kind to take us into their homes, to spend time with us and explain what they do, you know, all of these things. It's fascinating to experience uh, somebody else's culture and how people actually live and it's really quite similar to what we, we ourselves do. You'll never be able to convince somebody of what they would see or witness if they did not come personally. Civilization accumulate historical presence with time. Turkey emerged after several thousand years. 
What does it offer? Ephesus is probably one of my favorite places. It makes me want to travel back in time to see what it was really like in its heyday. I love the olives for breakfast. Not used to having olives for breakfast, and the apricots and the figs, and they look delicious. They've been doing this for centuries, and um, I am going to get into the pool after a while right. and take my shoes off and walk around, and maybe my aching feet will feel much better. <laughs> one of the highlights of Hierapolis. It's a gorgeous theater. It's a Roman theater. It dates back from second century AD. The stage has been renovated. You can see the lighter color uh, stage there. That's original. And underneath the stage is the rooms where actually gladiators were entering the arena as well as the wild animals. I, we're, we're fortunate, I think, to have Rana as our uh, program director. She loves her country and yeah, she's... That shows. Yes. I'm a program director, so I'm not a, just a tour guide. It is a privilege to introduce the history of the country and the people of the country and to make sure that when the people leave my country, Turkey, that they will leave with great memories. The name Pamukkale means cotton castle in Turkish. The ancient city of Eropolis was built on top of these white travertine terraces. Travertine occurs where warm spring water, 100 degrees and higher, drips for centuries, leaving behind calcium carbonate deposits that grow into pools and stalactite formations. Today we're here. We thought Ephesia was amazing and look at this. It's just beautiful. The water's really quite warm. Very, very lovely. Much like walls constructed with bricks, the present is built on the foundations of those who came before. Here in the region of Anatolia, present-day Turkey, the layers of history are deep. There are sites with evidence of Neanderthal man and ruins of the great Roman Empire in the times before Christ. The city of Constantinople is here capital of four different empires over 16 centuries and a center of Christianity. It was sacked in the 15th century and reclaimed as Istanbul, a center of Islamic culture and the largest city in the modern day secular republic of Turkey. The town of Buldan has been at the center of Turkey's textile production since the 13th century. These people are famous for hand weaving a thin cheesecloth type fabric of soft cotton thread and fringed edges. At the Buldan Clothing Cooperative, another generation of craftsmen spins a traditional loom, operated by both hand and foot. They are weaving for um, 
scarves, they're weaving for tablecloths mainly, and they do ship these. It's not only for Turkey, they ship it to France, uh, Italy, especially to the countries that they don't have such a fine cloth. This has been here for how many hundreds of years, did she say? Yes, yeah, seven or eight hundred years. But they're still doing it the old way, which is so time consuming, but so beautiful. I think it's great that we got to see this net, and now we get to see some of the products down on the street. I like trips where we really get to interact with the people of the country, be able to see how they live, have an exchange with them. So I'm walking to the ateliers right now. Come with me, take a look, learn about it. So it is the back streets is the key word maybe. That's what we show to our guests. This one is called Russian olives. Oh. They're almost like a wild olive trees and they are ripe like this since the Turkish people didn't have much of dessert, you know, they ate these. And when you take the inside out and take the skin out, it comes out to this. It's almost like a furry, a different kind of a fruit. You chew on it and it dries your mouth like you're licking like a lemon almost. Anybody wants to try? Is there anyone that is brave? There you go. Let's see, peel it up and let's see the facial. <laughs> Good. Good? <Sweet>. Swedish. <laughs> to truly feel the presence of time here, when you come to the crossroads of Turkey, dive right in. It's guaranteed that you will lose uh, 10 years after you take one Turkish bath. So some of them are taking a couple of Turkish baths today. I guess, you know, you hear all about the neighboring countries and you expect, well, maybe there'll be some turmoil and unrest, but it's not. It's very peaceful. <laughs> <laughs>